All right, it is a privilege now for me as we move into one of our final sessions, and it is the commissioning portion of our time together. And I cannot think of anyone better to lead us in this session than the Executive Vice President of the Family Research Council, General Jerry Boykin. Uh, General Boykin has served as the Executive Vice President of the Family Research Council since retiring from the United States Army after 36 and a half years of service to our country. He is a founding member of the Delta Force. Uh, he commanded the Army's Green Beret as well as the Special Warfare Center and School. Uh, he is an ordained minister with a passion for spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ and encouraging Christians to become warriors in the kingdom of God. And I watched him. He's one of those, he's one of those um, men that I, I, I watched from afar. I didn't know him, but I saw that uh, he, as a three-star general, came under attack because he had the audacity to speak truth. And in this world of politics where political correctness reigns, uh, that can get you in trouble. But what I liked about the general is that he didn't back down, he didn't make apologies, he stood his ground, continued to take the incoming, but did not compromise the truth of God. And it took me a while to recruit him and convince him that he needed to be at the Family Research Council. Actually, it was his wife that convinced him. I went after her. She's the boss. <laughs> but he is a true American hero, a warrior in the kingdom of God, and I, he is a dear friend of mine. And I want you to stand to your feet and welcome Lieutenant General Jerry Boykin. Thank you all. God bless you. Thank you all. Be seated. First thing is, um, how many of you think that uh, Tony picks on me? Okay, so most of the audience has agreed with that. Now, it's okay because I'm, I, you know, I give him uh, a wide berth so that he can do what he wants to do. It makes him feel better to pick on an Army guy. And I'm saved. And... I'm living a sanctified life, so I don't retaliate on that stuff. But uh, first of all, uh, I got to tell you this story. This Marine <laughs> told his buddy in the barracks one day, he said, I'm going in the shower there and I'm going to commit suicide. His buddy said, what? He saw him go into the shower and all of a sudden, he heard this thud, and he went running in to see what this Marine had done. And he found this Marine laying in the middle of the shower with a rope tied around his toe. He said, what, what, what did you do? He said, I tried to hang myself. He said, most people, when they hang themselves, they put the rope around their neck. He said, well, I tried that, but I couldn't breathe. There's some Marines in here because there's a few of you getting it late. You're picking up on it late. Yeah. Well, thanks. I'm, I'm not your last speaker today, but I'm going to talk to you about some things that I think are important. And I'm going to uh, today. Uh, let me start out by saying, as far as I am concerned, uh, it is no longer acceptable to just sit on the church pew satisfied with the fact that you have been saved and you're going to heaven. God did not save us just so we would go to heaven. I am absolutely sure of that. I am the least of the theologians here. In fact, I'm not a theologian, but I know the word of God well enough to know that he saved us so that we could be warriors in his kingdom, not just so we would go to heaven. Yeah, we're going to heaven. That's our reward at the end of the tour. But that is not why God saved us. And now today, I think that we see a lot of problems in this country that had the church recognized that they were supposed to be out there winning souls, spreading the gospel, helping people, bringing the love of Jesus Christ. 
we'd see much less problems than we see today in our society. So I want to talk to you about four things. And those four things are encapsulated in four phrases that are the mottos of military units. And those four things are sua sponte, molan lebe, de oppresso liber, and ut prosim. You know probably from uh, reading history or watching the movies and all that Molan Lebe is the only one there that is not Latin. It is Greek. But we'll talk about it here in a minute. What are these principles? And uh, I just ask you to recognize that military units have uh, operated in the far reaches of the earth for a long time. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to Look at the history of some of these units today because there's a special message. For each of these units, there's a special message, and this is what I'm asking you to do. Take these four principles, go back, and make them a part of your ministry. Press upon people that these are important. The first one, let me see if I've got a... First one is sua sponte. Sua sponte. This I freely give. If you will look at the uh, crest on the left, that is an organization called Merrill's Marauders. Anybody ever heard of Merrill's Marauders? You'd be surprised how few people even know that there was a theater called the China Burma India Theater in World War II. It was commanded ultimately by Lord Mountbatten. It was focused on relieving Chiang Kai-shek uh, from the grips of the Chinese. And in 1943, Chiang Kai-shek was locked into a battle with the Chinese, with the, uh, with the uh, Japanese, and uh, there was a stalemate there in both China and Burma. And a guy, a British general named Ord Wingate, put together an organization that he called the Chindits, and he took them into the jungle, and he stayed in that jungle three months. He took 3,000 people into the jungle, and when he came out of the jungle, there were only 16 that were still fit to fight. Many were killed, others were debilitated by the environment there, the jungle itself. But as a result of that, he then encouraged the formation of a new unit that would go in and stay much longer in the jungle to relieve Chiang Kai-shek to take supplies from India all the way across the Burmese jungle into China to relieve Chiang Kai-shek. And they were given the name, the 5307th Composite Unit, but they were then later given the name of their commander, and that was Frank D. Merrill, and they were called Merrill's Marauders. And Tony, Tony has been down to where I live, and I took Tony one day and Randy Burt to meet with my mentor for over 30 years, a man that was my mentor, and that man was one of these Merrill's Marauders, and they sat and talked to him, and one of the most fascinating people you'll ever talk to. Totally coherent, at, at that time he was about 93. And in two weeks, his, uh, I'll celebrate the first anniversary of his death. He died uh, last year on the, on the 10th of June, and I, and I still miss him today. I miss being able to sit at his feet and listen to the wisdom of this old warrior, this old soldier. But he told me many stories, and, and in fact, I have read a couple of books about Merrill's Marauders, but here's a book that I would encourage you to get. If you don't know anything about the China Burma India Theater, you don't know anything about Merrill's Marauders, get this book. It's called Merrill's Marauders. It's written by a guy named Gavin Mortimer. A really good book, really interesting book. But they went into the jungle, left out of uh, India and cut across Burma, all the way into China, trying to get in behind the Japanese lines. They got into some fierce battles. They, they fought in an incredible way. And 10 months after they went in that jungle with 3,000 men, they came out with 300. As a matter of fact, well, this is working very well. Okay, give me the next slide, please. No, back up. Okay, now let's go forward one slide. Here's some of that 300 that came out of the jungle after 10 months. Look at them, they're a ragtag looking bunch. 
And they had literally been through hell as they fought the Japanese in that jungle. But their motto was sua sponte. This I freely give. This I freely give. They went in, and if you read this book, and you read the personal accounts of these men, they did not believe they would ever come out of that jungle, and most of them didn't. But they went anyhow. They knew ahead of time what they were up against. They knew what the sacrifice was going to be. They went into that jungle knowing that they would probably not come home. Sua sponte. You know what? Jesus went to that hill in Calvary. When we stood there at Calvary, when we were in Israel in, in April, and I, I stood there looking up at, at that hill, and I, I thought, my goodness. That's, that's where Jesus went and gave it all for us. Gave it all. You know what? You may not believe this, especially if you live in one of the Bible Belt areas, but there are people that don't even know who Jesus is. And they certainly, I, I was talking to a woman in Boston the other day, a good Christian woman. She's with uh, Kufi. And she was wearing a cross and she said her children were saying, what's, what's that? What, what does that mean? They don't even know that Jesus gave his life freely. We've got to get that word out. It gave it freely. You can't earn it. You can't buy it. There's nothing but this free in the whole world. In spite of what Bernie Sanders says about free education, it ain't free. <laughs> but this is free. This I give freely, sua sponte. Today, it is the motto of the rent. What is happening to my slides? Who's that goblin back there that keeps turning my slides off? It's a Marine. We got a Marine back there. <laughs> Did Tony tell you to sub a... He did it again. All right, come on, Tony. Give me a break, bro. Give him a slide back. All right, where's my knife? Oh. Here it is. Now, if you do that again, I'm coming back there. All right. This I give. On the left, it is now the motto of the Ranger Regiment. The Rangers, some of the finest, toughest young men in, in our nation, and they have fought gallantly. And I was blessed to be one of the original members of the Ranger Regiment when it was formed in 1974 down at Fort Benning, Georgia. Sua sponte. This I give freely, no cost. We need to let people know that there is hope through the blood of Jesus Christ. We need to proliferate that message. We need to equip, train and equip the people in our churches to be able to go out and carry that message. There's hope. You don't have to live in a drug-induced coma. There's, there's freedom. There's liberation. So a sponte. And then we go to the next one which is Molan Le Bay. Many of you know where Molan Le Bay came from. Molan Le Bay came from the Battle of Thermopylae in 480 BC when Xerxes brought 150,000 Persians. Many people say a million. The modern historians say no, it was more like 150,000 Persians into a small pass along the Greek coast en route to the city of Athens where he intended to destroy and occupy the city of Athens. As he came along that coast there, there was a very narrow area that he had to go through, and that is where King Leonidas of the, per, of the uh, uh, Athenians, well, not the Athenians, uh, the Spartans. King Leonidas of the Spartans brought his men there. He had 300 warriors, 300 warriors that he trusted. 300 warriors that from the time that they were nine years old, they'd been raised up for this moment. They'd been raised up as a warrior class, a warrior culture. They were taken away from their mothers, and they were raised as warriors, and they were brought forward. Now, he also had 7,000 Athenians, but in the, in the end, he turned the Athenians back to Athens and said, go back and evacuate the city. My 300 and I will stand here and fight. We'll finish this, but you get the cities evacuated. 
Well, after two days of fighting, King Xerxes, with his 150,000 men, he sent a runner, and he said, go tell Leonidas that this is foolish. This is, we don't need to keep doing this. He doesn't need to lose all his men there, his, his 300 that are standing and fighting so nobly. Tell him to lay down his weapons. And Xerxes sent him a message, and it was Molan Lebe. Molan Lebe. Come and take it. Lay down your weapons, he said. Xerxes said, come and take them. Come and take them. This is not a fairy tale. This is a true story. Come and take them. Is that not what we in the church, what we as, as ministers and pastors and leaders, is that not our attitude? Come and take it. I am not going to let you take my faith. I'm not going to let you take my opportunity to spread the gospel, to tell people about sua sponte, the fact that Jesus gave his life freely. I'm going to stand and fight you, and that's what Family Research Council does. That's our task. That's our mission. And through this pastor's network, we hope that we're building a coalition and a network of people that are going to have the same attitude. You're not going to take my freedom. Yeah. We're going to stand against you. We're going to do what we have to do. And we're not going to do what Romans 12 warns us not to do. We're not going to compromise. We're not going to conform to this world. Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. We're not going to conform to this world. We're going to stand boldly and fight against evil. Psalm 94 says, who will rise up against this evil for me? Who will take a stand against these evil doers for me? That's us. That's the church. We have to stand up against this evil. Molan LeBay, come and take it. I'm not going to give it to you. You come and take it. And that's exactly what we should be saying as a nation, as Christians. And then... The oppresso liber, many of you remember enough about your Latin that you know it means to free the oppressed. That is the motto of one of the finest units that's ever been created in America, and it's the U.S. Army Green Berets. That's their motto, de oppresso liber. You see it on their crest. You see it on their building. I'll, every time you go into one of their headquarters, you see the de oppresso liber, to free the oppressed. Special Forces, the Green Berets, they're organized into 12-man teams. I don't know how many of you saw the movie that has come out recently called 12 Strong. It's a true story about one of these 12-man teams, an ODA or an Operational Attachment Alpha or a Special Forces A team, as it is also called. Right after 9-11, they were sent in to make contact with General Dostum, one of the leaders of the Northern Alliance, and then they were told, take him and start conquering the cities within his region there. Now, here's a secret. By Christmas, they actually had taken back the whole country. But that was never the intention. Donald Rumsfeld sent them in to just stir things up. Rumsfeld knew that he just, he, it was going to take him a while to get his conventional forces deployed either into Turkey or Uzbekistan or someplace that they could launch from and come across the border into Afghanistan and, and assault the Taliban and Al-Qaeda. So he said, get these special forces teams on the ground. Get them linked up with the Northern Alliance and just get a, start something going. Just get a dust up. So maybe we can fix them in certain places so they won't impede our ability to come across that border. Well, these special forces obviously didn't understand their orders. They thought they said, go in there and win. <laughs> yeah. So they went in there and they got with these special, these, these teams from the Northern Alliance. And they were in that ODA 595, which was featured in that movie, is only one of the units that went in there. There's only one. There were actually probably uh, 15 or 20 of those teams working with different elements, and they all working together. 
They brought American air power and American artillery and they really brought the heat and they began to destroy <clears throat> the Taliban and Al-Qaeda and put them on the run. They put them to flight and pretty soon they had taken the city of Kabul and Kandahar and Khost and Mazari Sharif and all the other major cities and they had the country, they controlled the country. And all of a sudden the plan for them to just be an economy of force organization and dust up things uh, gave way to a realization that, no, these guys have just taken back the country. The oppressor will bear. You know, if you stop and think about it, there are oppressed people all over this country. You go, you go down, I, I, I challenge you to go down to the corner, turn left, go two blocks down, turn left again, and and look at what's there. There are homeless people. They're sleeping on the sidewalk that are high on something every single day of their lives, begging for food, eating out of trash cans. They were oppressed. But who is bringing the good news of the gospel? Who is going to them saying, Sua Sponte, Jesus gave his life for you. You can be delivered from this. You don't have to live like this. There's good news, there's hope. Freeing the oppressed, we've got to focus on freeing the oppressed. We've got to let them know that there's no cost to this. There's no cost to this. All you have to do is accept it. Look, I, I grew up, and I, I love the people I grew up with, but I grew up in a, in a, a denomination that <clears throat> I lost my salvation every Sunday. I'd get saved on Sunday morning, and by Sunday night, I'd have to get saved again because I was living a works-based faith, a works-based faith. I was not freed. I was not freed from the oppression of condemnation because nobody told me, no, you're going to struggle. Even when you become a person, you're going to struggle, but put it before the Lord. And I was so ashamed, I wouldn't go before the Lord with my problems and my sins because I knew he was disappointed in me. But nobody told me that I could be freed from that oppression that I felt every time that I did something wrong. That's a clear message we've got to get to people. And then, finally... Ut prosim, that I might serve. <clears throat> West Point, is a, as a single university, has put more uh, officers on the battlefield than any other organization. They have for, for a long, long time. But there are a couple of other colleges or universities that have uh, put a lot of people on the battlefield, and one of them is my alma mater. And it is the Virginia Tech Corps of Cadets. I, was, uh, I spent four years there as a Corps member, commissioned right out of Virginia Tech, and their motto was, and it didn't, it didn't have meaning to me until some years later, was a prosim that I might serve. Stop and think about it. We're not here to be served. Jesus didn't come to be served. He came to serve. As leaders, we need to be preparing the people that we have influence over to serve. We need to be preparing them to go out, take the gospel to a lost world that is oppressed and help to free those oppressed people. Unfortunately, we don't have enough people that understand the idea of service. Again, they're happy that they're going to heaven, they're, they're satisfied to sit on the church pews, but they don't understand that there's a biblical mandate, there's an expectation by God that you're going to be out there working in the fields, that you're going to be serving the Lord in a mighty way. Uh, last week, 
I know that last year I told you this story, but last week I had the most phenomenal thing happen to me, and I don't think I've even told Tony about it. We had the Council for National Policy last week out at uh, Tyson's Corner. And I don't know how many of you know Peggy Dow with Voice of the Martyrs, but Peggy came up to me and she introduced a, a man to me. And uh, he said, I was a missionary in Sudan. And I said, wow, I was in Sudan too. And he said, when were you there? I said, uh, July of 1983. And he paused for a minute and the guy said, uh, wow. He said, I know somebody that was there in July of 1983 and uh, he got captured by a bunch of terrorists. Well, I said, um, yeah, I think I rescued him. And uh, he said, was one of those men named John Pointer? And I said, as a matter of fact, he was. And the guy, the guy got a little emotional. He said, this is unbelievable. He walked away and he, he didn't say anything else. Well, the story that I think I told you last year was how we went into Sudan and went uh, because there were five American missionaries that were being held way up on a, top, a big tall mountain and a place called Boma Hills right on the border of Kenya. And they were being held by a group of terrorists and, and we were sent in there, just me and one sergeant, we were sent in to link up with the Sudanese and to help them launch an operation to go rescue these missionaries. And, and finally, when we got them all ready, the missionaries said to me, well, you are going with us, aren't you? Which I was expressly prohibited from doing. And I said, of course I'm going with you. And then I said to the sergeant, what happens in Sudan stays in Sudan. <laughs> so I jumped on the helicopter. We went in, made an assault up on the top of this mountain, this 3,000 foot mountain, and we rescued five missionaries. Amen. And we brought those missionaries back into Juba, the, what is now the the capital of South Sudan. We brought them back in, back into their facilities there. We said, uh, we can't hang around. We were headed to the airfield. We went down to the airfield to jump on the airfield, uh, jump on an airplane down there and get out before the news media caught up with us because we got a call that said, get out of there quickly. The news is on the way because it was already out that we had rescued five missionaries. And as I was getting on the plane, I saw this cloud of dust coming down the road and I, uh, I got back off the airplane and I walked over to the fence and it was the five missionaries. And they were weeping. And they came up to me and they said, uh, sir, we didn't get to thank you. And they said, we don't have anything to give you but this. And they handed me a Bible that all of them had signed. And I said to them, I literally said, you don't have anything? You have all you need right here. Those missionaries lived in the most abysmal conditions up on top of that mountain. I, I don't know how a, a person could live the way they lived, but they were there because they had a deep, deep passion to serve. What pro sim that I might serve? Well, that guy at the Council for National Policy just walked away emotionally, and he came back and he said, he said, uh, I have John Pointer on the phone. I hadn't seen or talked to this guy since 1983, the 8th of July, 1983. I got on the phone with him, and the guy began to weep. And he said, General, he said, I don't, I don't know what to say. He said, we'd be dead if you guys hadn't come to get us. He said, thank you for, for, for coming. I said, you know, uh, the Lord sent me. 
I didn't get up that morning expecting this, but the Lord sent me to. And he sent those Sudanese that rescued you. Those Sudanese Muslims that rescued you. He sent them. And I said to him, I said, do you know what the most precious thing that I have from my military career? He said, no. I said, do you remember that Bible you gave me? And he just began to bawl. He said, sir, that's all we had. And I said, yeah, I know. And that's all you needed. We have got to go about doing the Lord's work now. It is, we've got a window of opportunity now. Sua sponte, Jesus gave his life freely. Tell people that. Let them know that. There's no cost to it. Sua sponte, Molan Labay, you're not going to take my faith. Come on, try it, but you're not going to take my faith. I'm going to stand firm and I'm going to fight you. The oppressor Liber, I'm going into the toughest parts of my neighborhood. I'm going into the toughest parts of the world. I'm going to protect the persecuted Christians. I'm going to go in and bring the good news. Ut prosim. I'm going to serve. I'm going to serve. I'm not going to be one of those that just sits on the pews. I'm going to be one that makes something out of my life because God's called me to a purpose and it's my job to find out what that is and then to follow through on it. Ut prosim, that I might serve. Our president, Tony Perkins, has been shown incredible favor by the Lord as well as by the administration. And he had been chosen, as you know, to serve on the statutory council for international religious freedom. Now, it's going to take him a lot of work, a lot of hours, and a lot of time away from the Family Research Council, but all of us are pulling together as a team. And we're gonna make sure that he doesn't have to worry about what's happening in the Family Research Council. He'll be there enough to keep us on track. But he is taking on a task that he is already being hammered for by, and from every direction. He's being hammered. Everybody's criticizing him because he is a lightning rod when Tony Perkins' name comes up, he's a lightning rod because the left hates him. You know why they hate him? Because they fear him. They hate him because they fear him. So I'm going to do something here that uh, I hope you'll work with me on. I'm going to bring Tony out, and I'm going to, I'm going to ask that this group have a, a serious intercessory prayer for Tony today as we send him on his way to do what God's called him to do. And clearly God has called him to do this and to be part of this. And there's going to be ultimately a, 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 an attack on him that will be greater than the one that's on him right now. But we're going to pray that the Lord will bring him through this. Cover him with a protection. And give him wisdom and discernment to see the enemy before the enemy gets close enough to him to do anything to him. And we're going to ask for his family to be covered as well. So Tony, where is Tony? He, did I lose him? Huh? Is he back here? It, wake him up. <laughs> Over there? Oh. Don't ask. Did the Marine have to go potty? <laughs> huh? One or two? Huh? No, I was covering your flank. Yeah. Uh, and it's okay. a big one. I ain't touching that. I, 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 yeah. Nor am I. No, that's, that, that was beyond me. Come here, follow me down. Tony, would you, uh, would you stand right here? 
Down here? Yeah. Oh. Okay. Here's, here's what I'm going to ask you to do. I'm going to ask, a, if you're a P50 pastor, I want you to come up here. Tony, just sit down. Just, just sit down. If you're a P50 pastor, yeah, come on up here if you're a P50 pastor. Get up here. I want you guys to surround him. Um, lay your hands on him. And now all of the rest of you, I want you to, if you will, stretch your hand toward him. Larry, get up here. Come on. Come on up here. And now. I'm going to ask Larry Jackson to lead us in prayer for Tony. Let's pray. Father, we're so humbled for an opportunity to pray over this man of God. We commission him with you into this new assignment that you have given him. And Lord, we today stand with him, firmly standing with him. Lord, with our hearts, with our minds, with our lives, with our resources, to help him to advance this nation in the way that it must be advanced. Lord, you are looking for men to set in places. You set one up and take another down. And so, God, you have established him even this day in this place in the name of Jesus. Lord, we lay our hands in agreement and we say he is protected, his family is protected, and everything concerning his life, it is under your protection in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, in the name of the Lord, we ask that you allow that FRC would advance even greater because of this new position you're giving him. That men and women will step up in a way that he would not even have to look back. And Lord, Lord, it would not take him away from that that you've called him to do. So Lord, we bless him now. We bless him now. Lord, we speak divine blessings over his life right now in Jesus' name. Man of God, you are blessed. Everything you touch is blessed. Everybody that come around you, blessed. In the name of Jesus. Everywhere you are sent is blessed. Where you put your feet belong to the Lord. In the name of Jesus. We glorify the Lord in you. Hallelujah. We even commit today that when we see you on television, we won't just sit there and marvel that because we know you. We'll sit there and start praying over you and start calling your name out and start now undergirding what you're doing in the name of the Lord. We bless you, Lord, and we thank you for this man of God. We declare it. It is done. Come on, somebody say it. It is done. In Jesus' name. Amen. And Amen. Thank you.